thank you everyone for coming, uh, letting me talk about some of the work that we've been doing, trying to make schools uh, more inclusive spaces. Um, just from experience, uh, my colleague Gabrielle isn't here, she's unwell, but from our experience working with schools, we are starting to see this increased appetite for uh, school leaders to, <laughs> to, um, to create more safe, welcoming, inclusive spaces at school for gender diverse Akonga because we're starting to see that more. And that's not necessarily to say there are more gender diverse, but well, there are, but as we as a soci society move forward and become more inclusive, then these people are starting to kind of come out, um, you know, feel safe to authentically be themselves. And we're trying to make schools a safe place for them to authentically do that. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the resource we created that is like 60 something pages. So we're quite limited about how much we actually get to say. Um, we'll start with going through some Trans 101, some basic information. And I've got a wee activity just to help lighten that a little bit, challenge some of your own, um, your own thoughts and your own ideas. Um, I'll talk a little bit about gender diversity in Aotearoa. Um, some of those difficult stats that Lex alluded to. Um, then we'll get into the resource and I've got four main areas there that I want to talk about which are community consultation or engagement, strategic planning, local health curriculum and PLD and then we'll just end on the Potama resource and we'll um, maybe reflect on that a little bit as well. Cool, so we'll quickly go over some answers. I keep putting the clicker down, it's in my pocket. <laughs> Alrighty, um, so the first one, transgender, does someone want to yell that out at me? This table. <laughs> this is an umbrella term for people whose gender identity and or gender expression differs from what is culturally associated with what they were assigned at birth. Yes, yep, an umbrella term. Um, that one was very similar to another definition that's a little bit further down, so some of them were a little bit challenging, but I guess if you save them for last, that's a <laughs> process of elimination. Uh, cisgender, uh, that one's a little bit easier. A term for those who identify more or less with the gender assigned to them at birth. Uh, that's myself. That's probably quite a few people in the room as well. Um, gender identity is an internal sense of being male or female, neither of these or both. Uh, sex is the system for assignment and classification of people, typically as male or female, uh, that thing that we do in the natural world, you know. Um, it's not fixed or immutable, cannot be described by a single criterion, so our sex does not come down only to our genitals or to our chromosomes or anything like that. Non-binary, this was the term I referred to that was quite similar. Uh, an umbrella term for those who identify outside of the gender binary, having been assigned one of these genders at birth, they identify with genders other than female, woman, girl, or male, man, boy. Intersex is a range of conditions where someone has a variation of sex characteristics from birth. The variation means sex characteristics are ambiguous in the context of the sex binary. Despite this, they are typically assigned a gender at birth. Gender dysphoria is the dissonance between one's assigned gender and their personal sense of self. People do not see their body as reflecting the gender they identify as. Transphobia, stereotypes, prejudice and discrimination targeted at the community of people whose gender identity or expression differs from what is culturally associated with um, what they were assigned at birth. To misgender is referring to a gender diverse person with a word such as a pronoun or a form of address that does not reflect the gender they identify with. <sighs> and takatapui. <laughs> are only used by Māori to refer to themselves. Uh, this term is typically uh, is used similar to rainbow person or rainbow community or LGBTQIA+. Were there any uh, mistakes? It's fine. Um, well, I wanted this to be a place for learning, a place for us to get some things wrong. Um, an opportunity to learn a word maybe that we didn't know before tonight um, or just to remember some words that we heard in the past and stuff like that. Um, and I just want to emphasize as well throughout the night we are probably going to challenge a few of those assumptions and some of those things that we um, held true for a long time. But it is again it's just a place of learning and it's okay for us to make those mistakes and to correct ourselves and to 
ask people with that lived experience what those things mean for them. Uh, so yeah, did anyone come across a word that they hadn't seen before or that was new to them? Yep. I hear murmurings of the term cisgender. Yep. It's a, not an insulting word or anything like that. It's just, you know, if you had um, all of us lined up, we'd say um, we've got three transgender people, we've got a trans woman here next to me, I'm a cisgender man. It's actually a Latin term. Um, yeah, there you go, yeah. yeah. Clever, <laughs> clever. So I should have shut the yeah. Wi-Fi off. <laughs> so cis is a prefix which means on the same side of, whereas trans is on the other side of. So it's just, it's just a simple like, prefix on there. Um, the reason we, that we have cisgender as well is so that way it's not like we have trans people and the normal people. You know? um, <laughs> So another way uh, that we can learn and challenge some of our beliefs is the gender-bred person. Yeah. Uh, this is really, this is really fun because this is a really simple way that we can start to understand some concepts of gender. Um, and I don't want to spend too long on this because we do have a panel of people to actually talk about their experiences with gender and coming out and transitioning and all of that stuff. Um, but I just want to make sure that we do have, before we go further, just a basic uh, foundational level of understanding of, of the concept of gender, transgenderism, non-binary and stuff like that. So the gender bred person um, shows different aspects of gender. Um, it's a little bit hard to see from far away, but we've got anatomical sex here and then it's got a little label on where the genitals would be. <laughs> Uh, gender expression and gender identity. Each of these has um, kind of like a spectrum. It's got two, two arrows. So your identity is um, your womanness or your manness. Uh, your expression is femininity and masculinity. And anatomical sex is femaleness and maleness. And so that's uh, things like genitals, chromosomes, biological markers and things. And, uh, what we would typically take as a cue when we see someone around of what gender we would assume that they were or something like that. Um, but again, it differs from expression and identity. You can still feel a different way and you can express yourself in a different way. And one of the things I kind of want to challenge with this uh, concept, oh, first of all, is my little point up there, gender does not equal sex assigned at birth. And if we can understand that first bullet point, we're a lot further than many people in our society now. So, well done. <laughs> That's something that a lot of people will weaponize, um, that they'll use against us uh, because they don't have this understanding of these different interwoven concepts. Um, rather than think about these things on a spectrum, I like to think of them kind of like a color wheel. So rather than your maleness to your femaleness, it's, um, it's, it's more of a sphere and it's lots of different places you would put yourself that's very unique to you and your understanding. My view of masculinity will be different from your view and my expression of masculinity will be different from other people who believe that they are masculine and we'll all have our own underlying beliefs around that. They all interact to what we conceive as being mask or femme or male, female or neither or both and then how we feel inside as well. So we all have our own unique thing. We can't apply the same criteria that we have to everyone else around us. Does that make sense or is that <laughs> overwhelmed anyone? Um, yeah, and so I've also included just a wee resource there. So you can go to the Genderbred website and they have um, links to things like the identity, expression and sex just explaining some of those different concepts. Uh, I've also put a link there for gender minorities because they've got trans 101 and intersex 101 stuff. Um, I've also got a resources slide at the very end with lots of different websites um, that you can find a lot of that basic information um, if you want to build your understanding on that. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about gender diversity in Aotearoa. Uh, Schools play a particularly important role, um, and that's because they empower people to be their authentic selves. 
Um, we finally, in New Zealand, we've got research and surveys that are coming out that are specific to us and our communities that give us uh, a little bit more of a realistic understanding of the people in our community. Um, and I do apologise, this is the part that Lex said is, um, is hard, it's quite dark. Uh, so, we've got two primary sources of evidence that we've used. One is the Youth 12 survey from 2012 that included gender diverse young people, but it wasn't made specially for them. Uh, the other is the Counting Ourselves survey from 2019 um, that targeted trans identities in Aotearoa. It's not specific to school age people, but they were included in the sample. Counting Ourselves are doing their next round of sampling now, so we expect uh, new results next year. Next year, yeah. Next year. Yeah, it just helps us keep track of, of stuff like this. So the Youth 12 survey um, back from 2012 found that four, roughly 4% 4 of students reported that they were either transgender or that they were not sure of their gender. Recognising that that's 2012, uh, we might have moved on from that number. It could be more, it could have stayed stable. Um, also next year, I believe, is the first year that the census will be collecting gender and sexuality um, identity. So we'll get much more accurate information from that. The County and Ourselves survey in 2019 found that 71% of trans people aged 15 and older reported high or very high psychological distress. Um, that's compared to 8% of the general population. 71 versus 8% is uh, quite a large saddening disparity. 56% seriously contemplated suicide in the last 12 months with 37% making attempts. That's not specific to school age, um, secondary age students, that's everyone above the age of 15. Uh, we would assume probably quite a few are in school or had a bad experience with school or whatever. 56 is still super high. <laughs> that's more than half. Um, contemplating it and again that's within the last 12 months of when they took that survey so over that 2018 year period there and the same survey the county in ourselves survey found that 49 percent of trans students had been bullied in the last 12 months so roughly half these are approximately four times higher than that of cisgender secondary students and that's taken from the Youth 12 survey, so that's quite bad as well. 62% of those who were bullied said that it was because of their gender identity or their expression, not for other reasons or general reasons. So again, the bullying rates are very, very high. Um, yeah. Sorry for the big downer. <laughs> I think it warrants discussion though, because it gives us a bit of context as to why we think this is important, why we think schools can... Um, can, can put themselves in a position to make their environments more inclusive. Um, especially when we're talking about uh, roughly half of this minority community contemplating suicide, something like that. Um, from our experience as well, talking with schools, um, quite often well-being will be woven into the vision and values of a school. And it's usually mentioned quite a lot in the strategic planning or the annual plans that um, you know, we've got specific well-being targets and goals and stuff like that. Seems like a good area to target that if we've got people who are being bullied at a much higher rate. And again, it's not that it's not applicable to us if we've got four of 100 people reporting that they're transgender or not sure of their gender. So uh, as Lex said, if we're not sure or we're not seeing them, uh, they're there and they're coming. <laughs> so we need to be prepared for that. Um, so that's my two main points there. Waiting to have an openly trans, non-binary or similar student runs the risk of continuing cis-normative structures that disadvantage gender diverse akonga and prevent them from coming out and authentically expressing themselves. Schools have or inevitably will have gender diverse akonga. Being advocates and creating safe learning environments helps them thrive as their authentic selves. I'm trying to say that if we do nothing, if we go with the status quo, then we're at risk of failing those young people. Those stats don't change. Um, we don't see any improvement to well-being, even though we say that we have a commitment to it. 
Um, if we're proactive though, if we recognize those people are in our communities and they're in our schools now, then we can put things in place, we can prepare ourselves, we can take affirmative action to make sure that we get better outcomes for them. Which brings us to the report that we have put together. I've got a link for it at the bottom and I've got that in the final slide as well. Um, I know some people have, have downloaded and flicked through it. Um, there's a lot of stuff there, but I made sure that there was little summary pages for each chapter if you don't want to read the whole thing. <laughs> and they've all got recommendations as well, each section. So um, if you do want to go through it quickly, there's lots of little bits that you can, yeah, you can go through. Um, so we'll go through briefly these first four areas, community consultation, uh, strategic planning, local health curriculum, and PLD. For single sex schools, um, I haven't included that, A, because of time, um, B, because it won't be applicable to everyone here, but also if we understand those first four points, it's pretty much all of that stuff but for single sex. Um, also with the Potama resource, the printout that you've got in front of you, there should be a link for rainbowrights.org um, and if you go there, then that's got um, some of the, the legal side of things um, for single sex schools for them to consider when they're taking in students who might be gender diverse or if they're planning on transitioning, for example. Uh, physical facilities and education briefs. Physical facilities is uh, quite self-explanatory, mostly with uh, non-gendered bathrooms and things like that. Um, when schools go into the education brief stage, you know, that master planning phase for new builds and redevelopments and stuff like that, um, we recommend going to Ministry of Education and Human Rights Commission best practice guidelines for things like bathrooms. Um, that's a very brief part of the overall report, but if you're in the middle of that, then yeah, give it a read. So, community consultation, first of all. Um, this is put first just because it kind of precedes other things. Often when we do something like strategic planning or um, master planning, uh, local health curriculum, we need to consult our communities. Um, we're using the word consultation and engagement kind of interchangeably. I recognize that they can have slightly different meanings depending on um, the context, you know, when you're legally required to consult. Um, the consultation and um, engagement does affect the day-to-day -day running of schools. As I mentioned, you know, when you do these um, reviews of your strategy, when you're looking at your physical spaces and things like that, that's going to affect the way that your school's operating on a day-to-day -day basis. So, for approximately five or less minutes, maybe talk among your table or the person next to you, um, how do we include gender diverse voices in these community processes? So think about things such as um, the modes of communication, how we communicate, the kinds of, the, the type of language that we're putting out into the world. So uh, some of the points that I wrote down, um, we can specifically seek the feedback of gender diverse people in the community. That's not always gonna be possible. We might not have parents who are gender diverse themselves probably quite unlikely at this stage. Um, and unless we're doing a community-wide survey, we might not be able to capture that voice. Um, language should be gender neutral, we've talked about that. Feedback channels should be anonymous and confidential, we've talked about that. Gender diverse akonga are experts on their own identity and they may be consulted on things that affect them. So if you've got someone who's out loud and proud at your school and you're wanting to know something about them, how you can support them, maybe you should ask them uh, because they're the experts on themselves, you know, um, rather than everybody call this person by these pronouns from now on, you should maybe ask them what they are before you start doing that. Um, not all feedback will be positive, that was the point. Schools should consider their responsibilities to keep Akonga safe. In the report, we really highlight uh, the importance of the NELP, which is the National Education Learning Priorities, and priority one is, um, is for making schools safe and inclusive spaces and that does explicitly say LGBTQIA plus in there. Um, you know, schools have this responsibility to keep people safe and you're going to get some of those voices from people in the community. You can listen to them, we can acknowledge that they exist. Um, 
to say that a child should be kicked out of school just because of the way they identify that person's probably not coming from a place of love. Cool. Um, when we spoke to some gender diverse rangatahi here in Christchurch, um, when we talk about something complex like consultation, um, we can't get into the nitty gritty stuff, but we did talk about, um, about language, about pronouns and names and stuff like that. So the first quote up there, teachers rolled their eyes at using pronouns. They mis misgendered a friend and when they were called out on it, they rolled their eyes and said, eh, whatever. That was from a non-binary person, uh, age 16. They would not use correct pronouns. They would not use the correct name, even though it was changed on the roll from a trans person, 18. I haven't come out yet to my school. Teachers keep getting it wrong and they keep misgendering other students. Uh, the point there is that when we refuse to change our own behavior, um, they're not going to feel safe coming out. And that brings us back to that point of you might not think that you have that student in your school. They might be there and they're struggling with that journey right now and they need somewhere safe, um, somewhere welcoming if they're going to be able to get the courage to come out and be authentically themselves. We've got research to suggest that when we do that, they'll have better outcomes later in life the earlier they start and the earlier that we can support them. So for strategic planning, um, I just want to quickly refer to the note. You won't be able to read this and you don't have to. You can find it all online. Um, but objective one of the of the NALP, just up here it says, ensure places of learning are safe, inclusive, and free from racism, discrimination, and bullying. And I put a wee arrow to the bottom because the last point there does say, including those who identify as LGBTQIA+. Um, the T stands for trans. Yay. So, <laughs> that's them. Um, so, we whoops, might be aware that um, there are some changes to strategic planning taking effect in 2023 sometime, and I don't know if anything's been decided. I see looks of stress, that's fine. Um, <laughs> they will be required to align with the NELP, and so that's why we think now is a really opportune time to be thinking about this, because we can be thinking about that point. How do we link that into our strategic plan, and how do we do that in a way that's authentic? Um, Strategic plans might outline things such as your school vision statements and your values around inclusivity, or if you don't have a value around inclusivity, you might want to include that. Funny. An inclusive local curriculum, student well-being and targeting bullying, and then reporting on important statistics um, or like measuring your well-being outcomes against predetermined criteria, for example. Um, just some quotes from some people. It took five years of me being in the school for them to even think about changing stuff. They had an LGBT group. The way that they had it made it seem like it was a hassle. They made it such a hassle to have an environment for those people. I couldn't focus in maths because of how often they say he, she in the examples. I think they were talking about maths. I just think, why would they always need to say that? Uh, so that last person was quite distracted in class because they were really hung up about, um, about the examples of uh, Mary and John um, buying 200 watermelons. And um, <laughs> uh, the, one <that> really <laughs> the one that really spoke to me was this top one. It took five years of me being in school for them to even think about changing stuff. It's kind of someone taking a lot of a young person taking a lot of responsibility on their shoulders to advocate for themselves, to push a boulder uphill just to get things to change for the people who come after them. Change is slow and we know that, but if we've got strategic planning being changed now, maybe we can start to think about implementing some of those things. Just to say to that, like, so many trans people are basically pushed into activism and advocacy mm. because we're not given the basic you know, decency, you know, treatment of humanity, really. We're pushed into these spaces to fight for ourselves because we have to. Um, and, we'll, you know, as, as that student had to there, like, they, we shouldn't have to have the youth have to do that. Like, we should be able to provide that space and treat them like people. <laughs> um, like, for the top one, that students shouldn't have to go to school and feel like they have to fight just to exist. Because that takes away from, like that's an extra struggle added to studying, an extra struggle added to trying to figure out the answers to these tests. 
the issues with other students and it just for them that student it's just like constant battles not a single break because they have to advocate for themselves and for other students while trying to put up with, with what it's like being a teenager mm. Mm. Uh, local health curriculum something that you would be consulting on I think every two years so again, going back to consultation, there's ways that we can try to capture that voice and we can specifically target some of those advocacy organizations such as Inside Out. We've got someone here if you want to talk to them later about how you could go about that. Um, we can include stuff around gender diversity in the local health curriculum and why that's important even if you don't have one of those people in that class is because you're teaching kids, you're building understanding, you're building allyship. They'll be the future adults, they'll be the future teachers, future leaders. Um, if we give them a basic understanding of different people in our community, they go out into the world with that understanding, with all the different people that they're going to encounter in life and hopefully treat all of them with respect. And again, that always comes back to those school vision, school visions and value statements and stuff like that. Um, some of the areas, uh, I did actually consult with people about this. <laughs> some of the areas that we could include, Things like challenging the gender binary, our hormones and how they affect our gender, uh, the trans, non-binary, intersex um, and those communities of people, uh, sex versus gender versus expression versus sexuality such as that gender bred person which was kind of beginner stage and you could explore that as far as you want, culture and gender, um, for example the concept of takatapui, whakatane, whakawahine, uh, pronouns and representation of media, those are all topics that you could take, tailor that to different levels. Um, those organisations such as Inside Out, Gender Minorities, Rainbow Youth, they can help with that. Um, often when you consult on things like the local health curriculum, you're going to get a bunch of really ugly, nasty feedback from people because it's too controversial to be teaching this in schools. And this is my favourite quote from when we spoke to people. Anything LGBTQ, they won't do it. It's too controversial. But how is it controversial? Controversial. It's who I am. Um, it's tricky talking to parents, talking to the community about we want to teach kids about this thing to do with sex. We want to teach them about their bodies. We want to teach them these um, about different people in the community. And you get all of this nasty feedback. It's not controversial for someone to have an identity. Those kids are going to experience that later in life. Um, whether they identify that way or not, you are all experiencing it now, we're all learning together. Um, yeah, so I would challenge that belief that it's controversial to teach about gender diversity and include that in your local health curriculum. Professional learning and development, I don't have too much to say about this. Um, you may go to um, your LGBTQIA plus students and uh, kayako teachers staff in your school and you may get um, content and advice from them. They may even feel comfortable leading stuff. Uh, I would just advise that you, you only um, talk to those students who are out loud and proud <laughs> um, and not to make anyone feel like they're being cornered or that they have to be an advocate like we talked about before. Um, they might just want to be a spectator. Um, otherwise, there is a long list of organisations and I have got a final slide with some of those organisations there that you can speak to. Yes? I just want to say as well, like, don't assume that your LGBTQIA plus staff and students want to educate you. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very similar thing as cultural taxation. Um, there's a lot of things that if you've got a question about, a quick Google probably will help you find an answer. <laughs> Yeah, um, take it's, uh, it's not the same thing as not consulting something if it directs if it deals with a direct student, definitely consult that student or that staff member, but like you know, for teachers. <laughs> but we don't want to teach it. it yeah, <laughs> it goes back to to taking the volunteers, <laughs> taking the ones who want to be advocates or activists. Um, again, don't don't target anyone to force them into being in a position like that. And if you are struggling for content, here are some places you can go, Rainbow Youth, Inside Out. We have someone from Inside Out here if you want to talk to them after. Gender Minorities, they've got a th quick 30 minute ally presentation if you want to learn more about being a better ally. And Qtopia have got in touch to say that they are now accredited PLD providers and you can talk to them as well. Cool, I'm at the end. So this is the Potama, the resource that you've got printed out in front of you. I'm 
wrapping up my section, um, these pretty much just have little nuggets of information that are woven throughout the report. So it's not the entire thing. If you want more detail, you can go into the full report and see the recommendations there. Um, some sections are chunkier than the others. Um, but we've just got these yeah, little nuggets of information and then at the bottom, again, those organizations that you can go to if you want to find more information. Um, rather than talk about it now because I don't have time, but maybe as homework, you can all go home and you can think about where in this Potama you feel the most confident, where you're making the most development, the most change, where you've recently been um, activating new things and where you haven't considered or you've missed out or where you've got the biggest space to grow. We'll be reflecting on it later together anyway. <laughs> cool. So there's some resources there and contact details. Um, yeah, feel free to approach me after if you want to talk about the report, the full report, or the Potama. Um, and again, if you've got questions about anything for our panel, you can write them down on those post-it notes that you've got on your tables, and um, we'll collect them, put them up there for the panel soon. Cool, thank you. <laughs>